Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome. We're gonna go ahead and get started. And my name is Carrie Priest. I work here at the Staley School of Leadership and I have the pleasure of serving as a past member of the What Matters to Me and Why Lecture Committee. I want to welcome all of you who are here in person. Thank you for joining us for lunch today and for this session. And as well as to those of you who are on Zoom, welcome. If you are on Zoom, just a reminder to please mute your microphone. We'll be using slides throughout this session. Um, so you may find it easier to turn on the speaker view for the session. You're welcome to turn your camera on or off. Um, you're also welcome to use the chat for greetings, um, but please leave the chat off during the presentation. We'll also accept questions at the end in Q&A through the chat. What Matters to Me and Why speaker series is sponsored by the Staley School of Leadership and supported through the Across Campus Planning Committee, whose names appear here on the screen. And if you're in the room, could you give us a wave or stand? And we'd like to thank you for your work in offering this, um, this series, your time and service here. This series was designed to build and strengthen the bonds between the people who teach and learn and work together daily here at K-State to foster understanding how of how each of us embraces our values and K-State's principles of community. It's a space where we can come together and learn from one another. We all have stories, stories to share that reflect our values, our life experiences, and the lessons we've learned. Telling our individual and our collective stories is a way to share the values that define us. Our stories represent choice points, moments when we face challenges, made choices, experienced an outcome, and learned something. As we tell and listen to each other's stories of what matters most, we build and strengthen our community. So whether you're telling that story from here at a podium or um, or like as we're as we will hear today from from our guest David Allington, or if you're in a quiet setting with a friend or taking a walk across campus sharing that story, we all have the opportunity to really listen to what matters uh, to others as a way to intentionally build our community and work towards a shared understanding of goals. Again, we're so honored today to hear from David Allington. To help introduce David, I want to invite up Mark Hansard, who is a friend and colleague of David's, and also a minister in the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship. And while Mark is coming up, I'm going to make a quick transition and turn it over. Well, it's my pleasure to introduce you to David Allington today. David and I met at the President's Committee on Religion several years ago. We struck up a warm friendship and we started meeting for lunch regularly for several years now. And it's been a great blessing and delight to get to know David over these years. And I'm honored to call David my friend. As you'll see today, David's a talented artist full of creativity, sincerity, and enthusiasm. So David has been an academic advisor for the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work for nearly four years. He's also an associate professor emeritus of K-State School of Music, Theater, and Dance. He's a graduate of the Interlochen Arts Academy, and he has a Master of Fine Arts degree in Modern Dance from Texas Christian University. He has choreographed and directed at K-State, Manhattan Arts Center, the Columbian Theater in Wamego, and he's performed five summers at the Starlight Theater in Kansas City. He is the recipient of three commendations from the Kennedy Center American College Theater Festival for excellence in choreography. Uh, and he's also the 2017 recipient of the Distinguished Professor of the Year Award from the K-State LGBTQ Resource Center. He also has two bachelor's degrees from K-State, one in the humanities and one in dance, and he's working on a third bachelor's in social sciences right now at K-State. So David's presentation today is on the power of words. It's fascinating. I know you'll enjoy it. Let's give David a hand.
I want a large vocabulary. The right word will make me effectual. I curl up with the dictionary. That's a sign of a true intellectual. If you sparkle and gleam, then you coruscate. If you spend the summer, then you estimate. If you shed your skin, you exuviate. If you apologize, then you expiate. Ad libite, and that means improvise. We usually say ad lib, a term for bleaching flower, is a verb agonize. And you say costal when referring to the rib. A writing desk is an escritoire. Episteme is the spirit of the times. Someone gender fluid could be called neutral. Liards are old French dimes. If something is eidetic, it means it makes you see vivid and detailed imagery. If you need an adjective referring to your dreams, use the word oniric and mimetics means memes. A back totem is a handy man does things around the house. Dissonance is the ending of a poem. Surtech is a chemical we use to de-louse. A pied a terre, a temporary home. A physical condition is a quantum state. If you come into contact, then you osculate. If you flash like lightning, then you fulgurate. If you flog someone, you excoriate. If you met a fog, that means you bicker. Uh, Patois is vernacular talk. A uh, dram is a small drink of liquor. You may have heard about electrolytes, which are any of uh, various inorganic compounds, namely sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, chloride, and bicarbonate that dissociates in biological fluids into ions capable of conducting electrical currents and constituting a major force in controlling fluid balance within the body. <laughs> letters are symbols that represent sounds. Words appear when letters unite. When types are tough and when I'm feeling down, I learn new words and then I'm all right. As the first land grant institution established under the 1862 Morrill Act, we acknowledge that the state of Kansas is historically home to many native nations, including the Kaw, Osage, and Pawnee, among others. Furthermore, Kansas is the current home to four federally recognized native nations, the Prairie Band Potawatomi, the Kickapoo Tribe of Kansas, the Iowa Tribe of Kansas and Nebraska, and Sac and Fox Nation of Missouri in Kansas and Nebraska. Many Native nations utilized the Western Plains of Kansas as their hunting grounds and others such as the Delaware were moved through this region during Indian removal efforts to make way for white settlers. It's important to acknowledge this since the land that serves as the foundation for this institution was and still is stolen land. We remember these truths because K-State status as a land grant institution is a story that exists within ongoing settler colonialism and rests on the dispossession of indigenous peoples and nations from their lands. These truths are often invisible to many. The recognition that K-State's history begins and continues through indigenous contexts is essential. Good afternoon. I am delighted to be here. Now, I'm going to ask all of you to please, I know a lot of you are still eating, and hopefully you're a bit mobile. I would like for you to please find someone you do not know. You might have to move around, introduce yourself, tell them why you're here, et cetera. I have a project for you, so yes. Two minutes, maybe three.
job. <laughs> actually, yeah, really, that went great. I actually want you to stick or stick with that person for this next thing. So those of you who move back, if you might uh, find a space. So you have these markers and pieces of paper here. I'd like for one of you to take one color and the other to take another color. I was still chatting with my. Were you? Were you in the three? Are you? Oh, uh, I. I get one one marker in uh, yeah okay. piece of paper in between you one color one another All right so one one of you I would like to draw a triangle on the piece of paper then the other person is going to then draw a circle on the piece of paper that somehow is related to the triangle close to it inside it far from it under it over it but somehow related then you switch again triangle circle triangle circle two minutes. That's fine, it exists within the parameters of what I gave you. <laughs> Go ahead and take uh, maybe 30 seconds or a minute. Uh, talk to each other about what you created and what, how you made your decisions, how you feel about what you see. Better plan. Good afternoon. My name is David Allington. I am an academic advisor for the Department of Sociology, Anthropology, and Social Work here at Kansas State, one of my favorite places in the world. Uh, and I'm here to talk about things that I value uh, and what is important to me. I'm taking a little bit of a different tack with this than a lot of folks talk about their families, their upbringing, and tell us about them, which I think is great. Um, I think family's great, history is great. Uh, I am here more to talk about some more central values that I have. Uh, and one of them is creativity. Uh, I think creativity is essential. And uh, there is discussion over whether creativity can be taught. And I believe that creativity can be required, as I just did. I required you to create something. 
Uh, another thing that I really value is experience. Uh, and I want to share two incredibly influential books. Why isn't it working? So should I use the mouse? Oh, okay. All right. So uh, 2012, 13, I think it was, there was the K-State year of the brain uh, where this neurologist, David Souza, came and spoke with us and uh, gave experiential uh, events uh, about brain research and how people learn. And one of my biggest takeaways with that, in fact, I'm kind of wondering, can we bring him back? Because it was really pretty cool. Uh, one of the biggest takeaways I had was that the very first thing you do in a class uh, with students or in an event has a huge impact on the event as a whole. Uh, so, for example, in a class, the, the syllabus, the very first thing you read in a syllabus is usually the, the student's first experience of the class. And it's really important that that be engaging and exciting. Uh, and even Dr. Michael Wish, anthropology professor, it's not even it's not even something to read. It's a video he posted, he produced. Uh, it's experiential. And now the same thing happens in the daily classroom. The very first thing you do colors the entire class. So I was in dance, and in dance, attendance is extremely important. And I learned that starting a class by calling roll is a really bad way to start a class. <laughs> so I found another way to take attendance. I usually start a class with something experiential. That's why I began with a song. And I want to urge you, uh, when you're preparing an, uh, a presentation, where you're going to give a speech, when you're going to give an experience, think about starting with experience. It might be something as simple as show a video or play some music or have people engage with each other before you jump into information, which is congruent with this other book, The Everyday Work of Art by Eric Booth. Uh, Booth is an actor turned life coach. Uh, and that's, it, is a really important part of what of what he shares is experience before information. Give people an experience of what they're going to be learning, and I assure you, they will be much more interested in what you're going to impart upon them than if you just start with the information. The other thing about Booth's book that I value a great deal, um, I back up a little. Someone who makes a living as a creative artist may take offense with someone saying, I am an artist. I mean, I've even heard professional painters, you know, visual art painters refuse to claim that they are artists. I mean, that's one thing I've heard. And Booth kind of turns that on his head and basically has a value that we are all artists, every single one of us. If you're deciding how to arrange your furniture in your house, you are making choices about color and space and human movement. Same thing when you get dressed. And the same thing in what is really central to what I want to talk about today, when you speak or use words to write, even when you compose an email, this is a creative expression. This is a work of art. You are making choices about vowels and letters and shapes of words and meanings behind those words. So uh, that's what I'm here to talk about. I want to talk about words. Now, I'm here to promote an approach to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And uh, language is a huge part of that. And I will say it is not all that there is involved in the kinds of changes we need to make in our world addressing the issues of diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And I do contend that language is a huge part of this, that words have enormous impact in the choices we make. I'm sure you can think of words you just cannot use, sometimes because of linguistic history. That word has a historical connotation that is not right. Sometimes it's been used in a way that's not right, and sometimes it's just ugly and hurtful. And uh, what I did with you with 
your creative expression with the markers was I gave you a structure. And for creative artists, for all of us, a structure is a freedom. This is something that was a challenging to impart upon students, but a structure is a freedom. If I were to say, if I were working with, with dance students, you know, you have to create a dance where two of you are always touching, or when the music gets slow, you have to go to the floor, or things like that. These rules open up creative expression and are not confining. So my big point, my takeaway I want you to have is that if someone ever says to you, please don't use that word, I don't like that word. Maybe that's a creative structure. The dictionary is a big book. And there are so many choices of other ways you can work. And that is a freedom. If someone gives you a structure in creative work and language is creative work, if someone gives you a structure, that is a freedom. This is a depiction of the four books of the Wicked series by Gregory Maguire. Uh, Wicked is the book that uh, the Broadway musical was based on. Uh, and this last book, Out of Oz, is my favorite novel ever. Uh, and uh, Wicked is the story of the Wicked Witch of the West. Uh, and it's from the story of the Wizard of Oz from her perspective. Uh, and Elphaba is her name. Out of Oz, and so we would get, you know, we get, I could talk forever about these four books, but Out of Oz is my favorite one. And it is the story of a young girl named Rain. Rain is Elphaba's granddaughter. And uh, we kind of grow up with Rain and we see her start to learn. She's the granddaughter of a witch, so she starts to learn magic, but at the same time, she learns letters and and language. And uh, this is a quote. Words, she said cannily, honestly. Which ones? Magic ones? She didn't feel like saying that all words were magic, though she thought so. So for her, and I think for all of us, these things that we speak, these things that we write, the, that are made from these letters have an impact that is similar to magic or might be magic. Um, so I want to uh, also impart a, an image of language as a living, growing organism and not, not something that is static. So, uh, you know, a, a, an organism or a community of organisms, a culture of organisms might grow in one direction and then learn that that's not the way to go and then grow into another direction and, and learn from that. Uh, and um, I want to kind of give some examples of, of this that I've learned of just uh, well, don't go there, go there. Uh, one is uh, in the 90s, I read a list of words that are passe, words don't use those anymore, so use these, these are less offensive. One of them was, instead of disabled, say, differently abled. Recently, I used that phrase with someone who identifies very strongly as a member of the disabled community, and she told me, do not say differently abled. And I learned that this was a term that was coined by the abled community, and that there is a real strong impulse, particularly with her, but with uh, the disabled to commu community to reclaim their identity as disabled. So again, you know, the, the language started to grow one way. I, I thought this was the right thing to say, and I learned, no, it's not. Uh, and again, just steer the other direction. Um, be grateful if someone says, please, you know, that that word doesn't work for me. Could you, could you please use another? Uh, another example I want to give is that uh, I grew up taking a lot of ballet classes. And in the field of ballet, uh, it's very common for someone to refer to uh, a, a dance studio full of women with the term girls. And I once had a student say to me, please don't say that. And my, I, I was a little different then. And my immediate response was, oh, come on, I just mean everybody. I don't mean anything bad. It just, it's just a word. We use that all the time. Everybody says that. And I thought about it. I thought, you know what? No. 
I'm calling a room full of adults children if I look at the meaning of the word I'm using. And there's so many other options. I can say people, folks, dancers, all y'all. There, there are many ways to go. Uh, so, again, a structure is a freedom. I, I want to talk some first. I want to talk about some words I can't stand. Uh, but first, I want to talk some, about some poems. So if you were, if you needed to, to talk to someone, and, and because their church, which is located in urban sprawl, sets a lot of fires, you need to have a conurbation, conflagration, congregation, conservation, conversation. Sesquipedalian. Anybody know what sesquipedalian means? It means having many syllables. <laughs> Pestiferous. This one isn't this is guessable. Pestiferous. Nope. In the early 20s, we lived through pestiferous times, spreading or bearing disease, especially deadly epidemic disease, pestilential. This part, to divide into parts, separate sunder. Upon completion, we disparted the jigsaw puzzle. Levo rotatory, turning to the left. Dextro rotatory, turning to the right. Make a dextro rotatory turn onto Juliet, then a levo rotatory turn onto Bluemont, drive six blocks, and the campus will be on your right. <laughs> and I think the next one is my absolute favorite. Oh, yes. Pretermit to let pass without notice to disregard. I aspire to pretermit bullies. Pretermit is a way of saying, don't let it bother you. Now, I'd like to talk about my least favorite word ever. Sorry. Sorry. And um, I could talk about this word for a very long time, but we don't have that kind of time. Uh, I uh, particularly, I, it, in a lot of ways, I don't like this word because of how it's used in our world. And the more I dug into it, I realized I just don't like this word. In our world, we tend to say sorry, not when we're wrong, but when the other person's wrong. You're not getting in without a ticket. Sorry. I understand you don't like that word. I'm going to continue using it. Sorry. Uh, and then there are ways it's said, particularly when it is by itself, when it is sorry with nothing else attached. Uh, things like, uh, sorry, it's too bad you don't like it, sorry. Here's another one is, sorry, this kind of, you're being ridiculous, sorry. Uh, and I, I do understand that that for a lot of folks, it's it's kind of a reflex. There's just there are people people who say sorry a lot. In in working with my advisees, I usually will pretermit their sorries unless they hit a certain number. If they hit a certain number, it's usually you apologize four times, and often it's not even things like I'm not wrong, you're wrong, but just basically uh, things like. Uh, my internet went out, sorry. You didn't do that. Or maybe my internet went out and they say sorry. It's like, no, you, do, you don't need to apologize for my mistake. Uh, and so often it's, it's I, I've said, you know, for four times you, you've said sorry for things that are not your fault. So I'm going to give you a little challenge if you choose to accept it. And that's, can we get through this advising meeting without your saying sorry? If you say it, that's okay. That's okay. It's not a big deal. If you choose to take on this challenge, I would like to see how that goes. Uh, now, sometimes people say, you know, well, they may have said sorry, but they didn't mean it. And I contend, no, actually, they meant it. 
This is one of the top definitions of the word sorry. Feeling sorry, feeling sympathy or pity. So you don't like what I did. I feel so bad for you. I feel, uh, feel this kind of grief. Now, I will say it does make sense if you are empathizing with someone who's in grief. I was sorry to hear about your loss. That is one that does kind of make sense to me. However, if, oh, I, I don't know, if you, if you touch me inappropriately, you know, it, I need you to not touch me inappropriately. I don't need you to feel grief for me. I just need the, I just need the behavior to stop. Uh, another definition, sorrowful, grieved, or sad. So uh, I, uh, in dance, there's a, there's a rule that, uh, that people, are, people are dancing in the studio. When they're done, they go forward into the studio and around, and the next group comes in from the back. This is just basic traffic. So uh, I had a student who three times, three times she finished her dance. I had explained this already and turned and went that way through the group that was coming in. Each time she said, sorry. And I finally, I finally said, asked her, why are you doing this? And she said, well, I don't think that that really matters if I go that way or that way. And I said, well, when you say sorry, what do you mean? She says, well, I mean, I feel bad that you don't like it. She had no intention of changing her behavior, but she wanted to express her grief for me. Uh, so then um, apologize uh, is uh, a synonym somewhat. Uh, and Recently, I was I was on the phone with someone. Uh, I had called this person earlier in the day, and uh, they were on another line. So it's like, oh well, just leave a message. And and they called me back, and and they said, I apologize, I wasn't able to take your call. I was on another line with a student. You don't. I did, I would never expect someone to hang up on a student because I called, unless there were some extreme extenuating circumstance, which you know is rare. Uh, and so that, that's another thing. And then uh, often you service people of, you know, uh, can I text back to the dentist, the office that I, I'm going to make it to this appointment? And, oh, oh I apologize, sir, that doesn't work. I, and it's like, well, did you, did you write the texting program? It's not your fault. <laughs> uh, so apologize is a very interesting word. It, it is similar to the words bolt or the word Dust. It means its opposite. So bolt means to lock something into place, or it means to run. Dust means to wipe up dust, or it means to sprinkle dust. Dust the top of the brownies with confectioner's sugar. Uh, so uh, I apologize is similar to sorry in this regard. Now. How do you apologize? Um, so I, I found this, uh, this article, and this was all about uh, this woman, Joelle, and she didn't list her last name, uh, was working with children and talked about teaching children how to apologize. I'm sorry that I used a word that you don't like. This is wrong, wrong because that's a hurtful, offensive word. And I'm glad I know that now. In the future, I will use another word. Will you forgive me? I uh, gave this presentation to Kamathi Choma and Mark Hansert um, a week or so ago and uh, to get some feedback. And Kamathi said, you need to tell a story about a time that you apologized and it worked, one with a happy ending. And he brought up a, uh, an event that happened, I, I think about three years ago to the day, it was right before the lockdown, right before the pandemic. I was at, I think it was called Difficult Dialogues. And uh, this was a, a gathering to talk about diversity, equity, inclusion. And this was particularly about race. And um, I, I said something that my intentions were good. 
And I said something that was wrong that I wish I hadn't said. Uh, in this big group, this event that was all about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And I was I was repeatedly told on no uncertain terms that I just said something that was not right. And uh, I, I ended up saying, after I, I, I was able to talk again, I said, you know, I, I talked a little bit about language and how, how I find myself saying a lot, okay, I won't ever say that again. And I just want everyone to know that thing I just said, I will never say it again. And uh, actually, people just cracked up and I got applause. Uh, and uh, Kamathi was like, this was great, David. You, you were humble and you, you made a commitment to change and you acknowledged that you'd done something wrong. And for me, I'm still just kind of embarrassed about it. And I can't tell you what it was I said because I said I'd never say it again. So uh, that's my example of the of an apology that worked. This is a very ugly sentence. Uh, often people use this after a pretty deep insult. Uh, and uh, it's one that I do my best to refrain from saying this sentence. Um, and if you're interested, Ellen DeGeneres has a very good comeback for this. Someone says something hurtful to you and then says, I'm just kidding. You can say, well, then you don't know how to kid properly because we should both be laughing. Let's talk about but. <laughs> be careful with but. Be careful with but. I, I, uh, I learned in a writing class and around the same time, I learned that it, it's often um, spoken of in therapy to be careful about saying the word but, because but negates what you just said. So if I were to say, uh, you're an expressive writer, but you really need to work on your grammar and spelling. I just made the expressive writer go away. I just, I negated it. So, however, if you're offering feedback like that, I think a more effective way to do that is just flip it. You need to work on your grammar and spelling, but you're an expressive writer. See how that's that's more positive. And you still got that intellect. Like, you need to do some work here. And it's smaller because you, you followed it with a but. Don't take this personally. Now, Usually, the next thing that somebody says is extremely personal. <laughs> uh, and uh, I uh, quit smoking cigarettes in 2005. And I, I, in learning about how to do this and in going through it, I, I learned that it's not a good idea to think, don't smoke, don't smoke, don't smoke, because your, your subconscious hears smoke, 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 smoke. But your subconscious doesn't understand not. So... Uh, I came up with just FYI, uh, I love and respect the health of my body and I receive calm strength from deep breaths with just smoking nowhere in there. Uh, and so if you say to someone, don't take this personally, that's you, you just put into their mind that they're going to take it personally. That's, that's uh, um, how we operate. And so I'm kind of back to that word creature mitt. Maybe you can say, pretermit this. Although the, the problem with that is usually, if somebody says, don't take this personally, they're going to follow it with something they really want you to know. And so they're not going to want you to pretermit it. <laughs> uh, so I have another challenge for everybody, and that is to find some new words. I learned in gender, uh, women, and sexuality studies class that this is not the best word in the world to use. Uh, that the word civilization has an implication that our world, our culture, our buildings, our cities are superior to other cultures. What would be another way to say civilization? Society. Society. Thank you. 
community of humans. It's nice. I like the prepositional phrase with it. Community of humans. Collective. Collective. Some Star Trek board going on. Yes. <laughs> what else? Culture. 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 Now, uh, this one. I have a TikTok habit, and I saw a TikTok video where a man was saying, please don't use the word, the phrase master bedroom, because it harkens back to the forced labor camps of the American South before the Civil War. And uh, unfortunately, in that video, there was a prime example of people saying, I acknowledge that you don't like the word, and I'm going to continue using the word. Unfortunately, you know, they were not receptive or interested in changing it. And, you know, it's because it, it harkens back to pretty much what that room was for, for the guy in charge of the plantation uh, and the women, uh, the enslaved women. So, and I didn't get it. How, what's wrong with these folks in this video? What's like, oh, you don't like master bedroom? Well, what's another word? What's that? Primary, main, big, parental, even just something as simple as blue, upstairs, Jane and Ted's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and okay, well, my next one, yeah, I only recently got a different paradigm, different view on this one. Um, so I was going to add a little disclaimer caveat that there's only so far I can go with this in terms of changing words that someone asked me to. I was at a safe zone training years ago, and uh, there was a man there who was clearly, I really think he was there because his boss said, you need to go, you need to be more sensitive, you need to go to this, because he was not happy. His body language, everything, he was roll on his eyes, he was uncomfortable. And uh, a woman gave a presentation about uh, LGBTQ issues and spoke about more progressive churches in the area. Here are more progressive churches. Now this man went up to this woman at the end of the safe zone training and asked her not to use the word progressive in terms of churches like that, because my church is not like that. Quoting him, quoting him. My church is not like that. And you're implying that my church is not making progress. So I was going to say, I, I don't think I can do that. I think I'm going to call an LGBTQ-friendly church a progressive church. But then I got a, a, another view of it, and I heard about an event, an impending event on campus for high school students. And the people planning it decided not to use the word progressive in order to be more inclusive and apolitical. So that, again, it's like, hmm. Okay, so what is a synonym for progressive? Forward-looking. Forward I thought maybe vanguard, but that's usually the one person in front. What else? Oh, that's that's nice. I, you know, I'm honestly curious about. That's a word that would do this. What's a word that would be okay with this guy? And with, with me, opportunity seeking would do that. What else? Ahead. Safe. What's that? Safe. Safe. What's that? Evolving. Evolving. So I hope I've uh, inspired you to look at a restriction as a freedom, a structure, as an opportunity to be creative. If someone says, please don't use that word, the dictionary is a big book. And then there's an app called dictionary.com that's like <laughs> I live with. Uh, so that's, that's my spiel.
interrogatives or queries. <laughs> Uh, we have mics that so that the people on Zoom can hear. Your favorite word. I'm awfully fond of that pretermint, but I think my favorite word is sumptuous. <laughs> I also like hypnotic. You know what I almost did when I was thinking about this, when I was thinking, I should probably talk about my favorite word. I almost did a Wordle. Anybody do the Wordle word clouds? Uh, you know what I've heard, just here's a tip. If you're looking for work, do a Wordle word cloud for the job description and the listing of the job, because you'll see what they value most. And they'll, you know, they'll want to hear that big, that big word. Uh, in that case, and, and it's, that's a fun thing to do is like, well, go through about seven emails and see what's the word I use the most. Uh, but I also like hypnotic. I like that word too. Oh, so this is a comment slash question. So when you were talking about sorry and how much you disliked the word, it seemed to me from your examples that it was less about the word than the attitude that went along with the word. Mm -hmm. And so even if one were to substitute another word, if that same snarky attitude came through, nothing has happened. Nothing positive has happened. Yeah. Could you comment on that? Yeah, I agree. That's that's why I posted about what is a true apology. Uh, and that I believe if if we're feeling a need to for, for an acknowledgement of harm or hurt, uh, that ultimately what we want to hear is, I won't do that anymore. And, you know, if, and sir, if someone were to say, sorry, I won't do that anymore, they just fixed it. I mean, I would have no issue with sorry in that sentence. Uh, and, uh, and then you need to follow through. Then you need to uh, commit to that. Well, I have a follow-up, sorry. Yeah, please. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, you're fine. Sorry. <laughs> now that meant I was sorry, right? Okay, you know, I like I said, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, I'm pretermitting that sorry. Okay, yeah. so, <laughs> uh, so one of the uh, uh, options you put up there was, um, will you forgive me? And and what struck me, that's a good thing, but in a way, I was thinking, do, doesn't that put the burden somehow now on the other person? Now they have to respond, yes, I forgive you, or no, I don't. So, is. Is, I mean, it's better than, you know, a snarky sorry for sure, but right. I'm wondering if I was, I was wondering how good a substitute that was considering we've now uh -huh. burdened the other person for something I might have done wrong. Right, right. That's a good point. And that, you know, what one choice I could have made was just to let that off when I posted that. Uh, I tend to de-emphasize that, uh, when, you know, when, I, when I'm talking about this. Uh, and again, my, my issue is I just want a commitment to change. Um, and uh, I did have uh, a, a good friend, you know, knew that she hurt me pretty deeply. And, and she was like, OK, I know you have this whole apology thing and you got to show me how to do it. <laughs> and, uh, and she, you know, I sat her down, OK, here, here's this apology. And then um, when she got to will you forgive me, I said, well, I want to know a little bit more about why you did it. You know, it gave me an opportunity. Can, can you communicate some more? What, what is it about me that said that was okay to do? Uh, and it kind of gave me an opportunity to learn. Um, and at the same time, that is not the most important thing that I put on a screen today to me. So I, I see your point. David, I um, I think you obviated what defines a real word, and so I'm curious on your take on um, how the dictionary continues to change, and it's a printed thing, and so it isn't always encompassing of all words, like tweet is new to the, the generation. Yeah, uh, I, you, I, I'm not real well versed on how that works. I do know it's, I think the Oxford English Dictionary does once a year, does anybody know? Yeah, that once a year they'll they'll revise it, um, and it also goes with my point of this. Um, it's just constantly evolving, and I I think it's getting harder for dictionaries to keep up. 
with the way our language is changing. Are you in favor of that or in disfavor of, of what? Non-dictionary words. This is one of my question. Are you a constructivist? Do you like to add words to the language? Do you create words to fit situations that you need? I'm, I'm a construct. I, I like to add words to the dictionary. Um, yeah, I, I think that's a great idea. I, um, I, I kind of mentioned Michael Wesch earlier, but in, in his book, uh, The Art of Being Human, The Science of Humanity, the, the textbook for K-State's cultural anthropology class, um, when he teaches linguistic anthropology, one of the assignments is to create a word, create a word that you think needs to be a word, and then use that word and see if you can turn it into a word that a lot of people use. Uh, so um, does that mean I'm a constructivist? That's the way I think about it, okay. at least. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can. I don't know if I can say I've actually successfully done that. Um, but uh, I think it's a great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, but I, I'm totally in favor of. I mean, I I think we have to let the language change. So yeah, I'm in favor of that. So first off, this talk was amazing and very thought provoking, but I wanted to ask you, why did you pick this topic? Oh, you know, I was going to, that's in my notes to say a lot earlier. Uh, someone I respect a great deal uh, told me, well, I, I was in limbo for a few years. I, I retired from my job as a professor in 2016 and um, I stepped out on a limb. I took a risk. Because uh, I was ready for a change, and I had some scary years in there. Um, I thought I thought things would fall into place for me sooner than they did. And someone I respect and admire a great deal said, um, "David, have you ever thought about writing? Because you care more about words than anyone I know." So uh, when it came to why, and that's one reason. One reason, when I when I think, well, what matters to me and why? And also, Policia Bender did the last one of these, and she was so incredible. And you know, I did. I didn't want to try to have to. do This is my family growing up. It's like I'm going to do something very different. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to talk about something I value. Hi, David. Hi. Big hug. So happy to see you. This is so great. Um, she's a student of mine. She's heard the sorry lecture over and over. So many times. As soon as that sorry popped up, I cracked up. I've heard this lecture so many times in different iterations. So to see it like this so properly is mm, cherry on top. Um, my question are your thoughts on those people, you know, a word comes out, a phrase that, oh, like I liked um, master bedroom, right? I'd never heard that before. And the maybe traditionalists might say like, well, that's the word we've always used. That's the word. That's how it is. They're not maybe not so flexible on how language can evolve. Like you said, um, it's kind of a two-part question. The strategies on on how to handle those situations versus I know a lot of people feel like oh we're so PC now I feel like I can't speak um, I'm feeling challenged to express myself because I can't say this I can't say that what, you know and what's this space in between being um, smart, not, not smart enough, but being open enough to look for new words. Um, that does take some effort, especially if you're not, um, maybe a, you know, if you're not interested in looking at the dictionary and things like that, um, that wasn't the most direct question, but an abstract question for you to go off of. Yeah. Well, you're kind of touching on, um, one thing that I find really challenging in my work right now. Um, have you ever heard uh, calling someone out or calling someone in? So if someone says, um, makes, a, makes a racist comment, for example, uh, it might be the right thing to call them out. However, what I aspire to, and I don't know if I've succeeded, but what I aspire to is what you're talking about. What I aspire to is calling them in. 
is bringing them in to another way of thinking and being open to diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, and 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 seeing that um, it, it's important. And um, I've not quite succeeded. <laughs> you know, I, I can't say that I've succeeded at this. I will say. Um, you know, and that really makes me think of, you know, because I have students who who just, you know, <clears throat> express fatigue. I'm tired of all of this diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. And, um, you know, the classes they have to take, events they have to go to, uh, and particularly certain classes that, that uh, really emphasize it. And... Um, I I wanna I wanna say this is you know really important. You know, I I asked that once at a panel at um a Martin Luther King Day panel, my my first year here as an advisor. I and it was we we wrote our questions and I asked I asked about that. And one of the professors responded, well, well, the student told me that I'd say, sorry, we're doing this because it's important. And I don't know, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna call that person in. Um, I think it's really important. Well, actually, I want to kind of, oh, I still have two minutes. Okay. Uh, I was working in Manhattan High School uh, between my professor job and my advisor job. Uh, and I used the incorrect pronoun with a student. Uh, and he didn't say anything. Uh, but I heard from someone else. And so um, I went up to him later and I said, I just want you to know I, I used the wrong pronoun and that's not gonna happen anymore. Um, and someone corrected me and I appreciate that. And he just lit up like a Christmas tree. I, I, you know, I was afraid it was you know, like a, you know, some kind of uh, more disturbed or aggressive kind of response. And, and, and he was just delighted that I, I said that. And honestly, I get a real similar feeling with one of these students who's, who's, who's expressing this frustration and fatigue, doesn't want to change the way they talk, doesn't want to you know, learn these things they're having to learn. And I get the same feeling when I, I say, okay, tell me about this. Just go, just, I'm going to listen. And you know, and I got the same kind of smile the same kind of, thanks so much for letting me talk about this. Um, what I didn't succeed at was the next step, which was, okay, so I want to call you in now. Um, so I don't, I don't necessarily have an answer. Um, other than that's exactly what I wanted to impart here is, you know, the dictionary is a big book. I mean, somebody says, we can't say anything. It's like, come on. Have you looked at a dictionary? Uh, so, uh, Stephen, I think we're at our, our, uh, our point of time, and I want to let's express our appreciation for David. <laughs> is as important as answers, and so thank you so much for sharing the power of words, uh, helping us to think a little bit differently about the words that we use and the choices that we make and the ways that we stay in relationship and community with one another. And uh, thank you all for being here and enjoying our lunch today. Thanks to those online and hope we'll see you at the next What Matters to Me and Why. Excellent. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> both of us, both of us yeah, are publicly challenged. Sure.